uh, good morning to everybody and uh, welcome to uh, this edition of the um, Represent PA Breakfast Briefings. I see we have a number of, it appears that we have a number of new people on the call. So just to let you have an idea, Represent PA is a, is a PAC we started about seven years ago. We uh, raise money and invest in progressive women running for the legislature in Harrisburg, both the House and the Senate. Um, we started in order because Pennsylvania was ranks one of the lowest states in the country in terms of women's representation. And we decided, and it's both the Democrats and Republicans have not given women the leg up or the, um, uh, the money for early funding of a campaign. So that's why we started. Um, our main goal these days is to flip the legislature um, blue, but do it with strong progressive women. I'm Christine Jacobs. I'm the executive director of Represent. Um, and we're, we're a state, we raise money statewide with the idea that uh, once you elect somebody to the legislature, they represent all of us. We try and help to educate our donors and friends by having these breakfast briefings and by talking about the important issues in Pennsylvania. Some of you may have been in the call a week or so ago and got really depressed about the state of water in Pennsylvania. Why is water so dirty? Why is it dirty throughout the state? Why does Pennsylvania rank as having, I think it's about the third worst water in the country? Why does, um, and who's doing anything about it? And the answer is pretty much nobody. Um, neither the Department of Environmental Protection, which is greatly understaffed due to budget con controls by the legislature and by legislation. Um, and there's really no controls on what anybody puts or very few controls and very little follow-up on what goes into our water. And it's awful. And if for those in parts of Pennsylvania that depend on well water, they're finding that there's no place in their property where they can dig and find good water. All reasons that we had two, we had a senator and a state rep on talking about what they would do if they were in charge, what they would do if they were in the majority and could actually bring up legislation to protect Pennsylvanians. Important issues for all of us. Um, today we're going to be, and she'll be dialing in in a little bit, Congresswoman Madeline Dean from uh, Montgomery County. Uh, she was in, we got to know her when she was in Harrisburg. Um, I first met with her about six years ago, I think, um, when she was a state legislator. And we have followed her work both in the legislature and now she's in her second term in Congress in DC. And I encourage you to put questions into the chat and we'll start bringing things up. And, and I've told you, we just wanna have a conversation with her about Harrisburg versus uh, DC, how she's finding the job and, um, and what she knows that, you know, DC can't bail us out. The American Recovery Plan and the other plans that uh, the president has put forth to Congress cannot bail out problems that Pennsylvania is causing for itself. And so how she weighs, you know, what is she looking at in Congress and what are the things that she knows that we need to be doing ourselves. Um, but let's talk about some of the major issues going on in Pennsylvania. And as soon as she dials in, we'll, we'll flip back to her. If, did you notice in the um, census data that's now been released, Pennsylvania population is essentially flat over the last 10 years. It was growing slowly at the beginning of this decade and has tapered off. And what that means is since other states grew faster, uh, we've lost a seat in Congress. So we're gonna go from 18 to 17. We had a high of 30 something uh, a few years ago, a few decades ago, and every cycle since then, we've continued to decline the number of people as more have, you know, Montana, for example, gained a seat this time. And why does this happen? Why is population flat? Um, well, a lot of reasons. And if you look at the 2021 survey from US News and World Report, you'd find that we have, we rank 40th in terms of livability, 44th in the quality of our infrastructure. These are all out of 50, by the way. 42nd in our basic economy, 38th in how we treat the environment, and 37th in education. Remember, we have the biggest discrepancy between rich and poor school districts in the entire country because of our reliance on uh, local taxes as opposed to state money. We also, our college graduates graduate with the largest debt of any in any state in the country. 
And so all of these are reasons that Pennsylvania's livability, and they all are negative reasons for any company thinking of investing in Pennsylvania for growth. These measures are intertwined between our flat population and losing our uh, seat in Congress and um, without uh, improving on these other measures, how will we have growth? And by the way, our, the amount of uh, the number of people we have in Congress and basically our population largely controls the amount of federal money that comes into Pennsylvania. So uh, it's, it's, it's a situation that we're in. Um, and without fixing these things and without some priority on these issues, Pennsylvania will continue to decline in importance and also will continue to have one of the uh, oldest populations in the country, which again, you know, is a, is a cycle that as our population age, ages, we have fewer people in, um, uh, in jobs and we continue to decline in stature. So what we're gonna talk about with uh, the Congresswoman today is what are the issues that are Pennsylvania's to solve and where do we need support from the federal government? And we'll come back to some of these issues. Uh, because the population, um, because the census data has now been released on a grand scale, and now it's gotta come back to giving us all the, the detail on where the pockets of population are. Um, but as I said, Pennsylvania will go from 18 to 17 representatives. The plans for how this will be done and how those 17, will, the, how the districts will be drawn um, are gonna be in the legislature. And the way this works for Congress is the plans are drawn up by the legislature and the governor's signature is required. Uh, what's different this time versus um, 10 years ago is that at that time, both, although both chambers were Republican controlled, we had a Republican governor. And that's why we had such outlandish districts, um, if you remember the way they were drawn. A few years ago, the Supreme Court stepped in and said those were not good districts, they were not fair districts, and they redrew the districts. This time, the way it's gonna work is because we have a Democratic governor and um, the plans are gonna be drawn up by the legislature once again, maybe passed by our Republican chambers, but the governor will reject things that he considers to be unfair. Remember before the last redistricting that was done by the Supreme Court, Pennsylvania, which is essentially 50-50 Republican um, Democrat, we had 13 uh, Republican representatives in Congress and five Democrats. When the district lines were redrawn, we ended up with nine and nine, which is much more proportionate to the population. I uh, can't wait to see what our legislature comes up with this time. But if nothing gets decided between the governor and the legislature, the Supreme Court will once again have control over the drawing of the district lines. Things are different for how lines are drawn in for both the um, Pennsylvania House and the Pennsylvania Senate. There's a five member committee has control of how this looks. And the committee consists of the minority and majority members from both chambers. So that the majority members are both, Demo uh, both Republicans and minority members are both Democrats. And they pick the fifth person. Well, they met, they, they went out, they had applications of people applying for the job. They had 47 applications. They interviewed 30 people either in questionnaires, in person or via Zoom. And guess what? They could not agree on who the fifth person would be. So by law then the Supreme Court gets to appoint um, the fifth person for the committee and to find somebody who's quote bipartisan. They, this week it was announced they selected Mark Nordenberg, who is a uh, uh, retired uh, chancellor of the University of Pittsburgh. And um, so it'll be somebody from the west part of the state, but he'll be the fifth person on this district. So, um, and there are national implications to all of this. So we can't wait to see what, what happens and um, how this is gonna be determined. And let's bring up, good morning, uh, Congresswoman Dean. How are you today? Oh my goodness, good morning, Christine. How are you? I am terrific. We have 65 participants today. And so it's a, it's a healthy sized group, all ready to, to hear you talk. And uh, so welcome. I'm interested in what you were saying. Thanks well, for your 
Yeah, well, we're discussing redistricting and um, we're assuming your district is fairly safe. It was um, before this last Supreme Court drawing of districts, Montgomery County was divided into four or five different districts. Um, Valar Cush, who's chair of the Montgomery County Supervisors, uh, used to talk about how she didn't know who to call when they had a national issue because there wasn't any one representative who really cared about Monco. And so we're happy to have you there, you representing Monco, which is um, the third largest county in the state and really um, a strong representative for all things that we believe in, in in DC. So thank you for being here. Christine, it is my pleasure. And I'm looking around this room. It's a terrific room of uh, just great leaders. So I'm always pleased to be with you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I love your breakfast briefings and I look forward to when we can do them in person again. Yeah. Uh, because, me ahead. too. Uh, thank you for what Represent does. Uh, you have put more women uh, in places of power, uh, in places of representation, uh, which uh, you've played an integral role, all of the people on this call and the many others who have partnered with you. Uh, and I, I, I see Bill Ewing and, and our favorite men as well, but hi, Bill. Um, but it is important that more women are at the table uh, and represent, make sure that that happens. Um, you help give people like me the tools to succeed. So thanks for doing that. Thanks for doing that. Thanks for investing uh, in the future of our democracy here in Pennsylvania and of course, uh, across the country. Uh, you step in in the toughest races. You're not shy about it um, because you want the best for our Commonwealth. So uh, I'm, my theme today is don't count women out. Uh, I'll talk briefly and then I really enjoy uh, the chance for questions and conversation, frankly, uh, because I like to learn from you. But before we do that, uh, I want to tell you, I was asked to talk about the greatest difference between serving in the U.S. House versus serving in the Pennsylvania House. Well, I'll say the obvious one. It's much more fun in the majority. Uh, <laughs> I was six and a half years in the Pennsylvania House, always a Democrat in the minority, never able to have control over whether or not I could get a hearing on a bill or an issue, whether I could get a bill on the floor. Uh, and so it is much more fun in the majority. And of course, you know, uh, when I came into Congress in 2018, we had a terrific strong majority with the greatest number of women coming to Congress uh, and the just beautiful diversity. Now, you know, as a result of 2020, uh, we are down to a slimmer uh, majority. Still fun, still passing good stuff, but it's, it's scary. Uh, you know that we're down to just a two person majority in the House and the slimmest of majorities in the Senate, but it's powerful that we have both chambers. Um, so uh, I'm saying that to hint what you already are talking about, which is 2022 is going to mean everything. But let's take a look at what we were able to do in the majority. Uh, and it was stunning and we're continuing to do it. Uh, we were able to get the gavel at the hearings, pass legislation that lifts Americans, American families. We were able to have hearings and pass legislation on issues like gun violence, the protection of our planet, voting rights, equality, and so much more. Uh, in my first year in Congress, I, I, you know I wanted to be on judiciary and I've had the honor of serving on judiciary and financial services at this incredible moment in our history. But Chairman Nadler chose in 2019 to have the very first hearing of the Judiciary Committee of the 116th Congress on gun violence. That was the first time in maybe two decades that Congress spoke or had a hearing on gun violence. And in February of 2019, just a few weeks into the new Congress, we passed universal background checks. We passed the closing of the Charleston loophole. I use that as a model to say what a difference a majority makes. Uh, instead of ignoring the issue for decades, we tackled it. Unfortunately, you know the rest of that story. We did that with hundreds of bills. We passed powerful bills, HR1, the Greater Protection for the People Act of voting uh, and our voting rights. We passed the Equality Act. We passed the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Uh, you know that we passed a lot of powerful legislation. Uh, much of it, sadly, uh, Mitch McConnell enjoyed putting into what he called his graveyard. 
Uh, but we were in the majority passing powerful bills and we're doing it again. The other thing that we did do, uh, and I'm, I'm very proud of this, is in a bipartisan way, tackle the pandemic with the Families First Act, with the CARES Acts, multiple CARES Acts, with the Omnibus Act at the end of the year. Uh, we were able to do that in a bipartisan way. You saw what happened though, however, with the American Rescue Plan. Uh, that was passed, sadly, with no Republican support. Uh, so this, this, uh, this behavior of Congress, I think, is not sustainable. We need to have, I want, a stronger majority in the House, a stronger statement and a majority in the Senate. I hope 2022 we can all work to do that uh, so that much of this legislation will pass. Uh, I'm very proud of, of the bold legislation that is the American Rescue Plan, lifting up families, children, lifting children out of poverty. These are the kinds of things that I came to Congress to do, to tackle the issues that affect the many, not the few. Uh, so there's much, much more to do. Uh, we, we need to make sure that we hold these majorities, grow them stronger for the simple reason, not of politics, but of policy. These are the policies that I think most Americans want, a robust infrastructure plan, which will create jobs. The American Families uh, Plan uh, that uh, the president rolled out in his joint address. These are bold initiatives that meet this historic moment of economic uh, recession, as well as a pandemic. Uh, and they are bills that will take us forward. Uh, so I hope we'll be able to continue to pass these large bills uh, with, with support of Republicans and Democrats. If not, as you've heard from the president, we'll move forward. He will move forward. And by way, I suppose, of reconciliation, uh, we will be able to get infrastructure investment and family investment. Uh, and so with that, I will yield back to you, Christine, to take whatever questions anybody has of me. And several people have sent them to me in advance. I want to start by just commenting on what she said about being there to work on policies. Many of you have heard me say um, over and over again that some people run for office to be somebody. Some people run for office to be able to look in the mirror and say, hey, I see a senator. I see a representative. I've got power. But some people run for office to make policy changes. They want to do something. They see a need and they want to get there. Um, we always, as we interview candidates or read candidate questionnaires for represent, we're looking for candidates who want to do something, impact Pennsylvania. And that's why I love what, um, can I call you Madeline? Can I still call you that? I, oh, I just want to make sure. yes, Matt or Madeline. Okay, you know, I always did. And then I'm, you know. Um, but, you know, as Madeline talked, it was, uh, she talked about what she wants to do, how she wants to impact Pennsylvania. And that just warms my heart. Um, so I have to start with a question about Congress versus Harrisburg. Um, I've, you know, you talked about the joy of being in the majority. A little bit on January 6th, did you think, well, you know, Harrisburg may not have been so bad? Oh, no. Um, <laughs> no, no. I know that, that um, Washington is the place I want to be. Uh, and what January 6th did was just sadly, uh, confirm what I knew was at stake, which is our very democracy uh, has been threatened. Uh, and it's a precious thing. It is not a guarantee. It is something we have to tend to and, and garden and, and protect and lift up and build stronger. Uh, and so, no, I, I had no regrets of being there on the 6th of January. If anything, it made my resolve stronger. So, you know, and you mentioned being on the Judiciary Committee, and I'm, I'm sure we're all aware that the, being on the Judiciary Committee led for you to be on the impeachment um, prosecution team um, that appeared before the Senate. Um, and in only your second term, we were so proud to see you there. And I think you represented us all very well. Um, through your committee work, what are your priorities right now? What are the things that you personally are working on to get your name on some legislation? Well, thank you. And I, I do want to say that serving on uh, as an impeachment manager was an extraordinary honor. I, I felt it as a duty. Uh, I literally was standing in line to be tested for COVID because I had been in that safe room uh, during the insurrection uh, and members were testing positive for COVID. So I was in line 
waiting for my COVID test when Speaker Pelosi called me and asked me to serve. Uh, and she said, would you like to think about it? I said, no, 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 I'll, I'll do it. She said, wouldn't you like to ask your family if this is uh, something you wanna be doing? I said, no, no, uh, this is an honor and I feel a duty. Uh, so uh, I, was, I was pleased to be a part to, to mark that moment in history. And I think you saw, uh, we were led by Jamie Raskin just masterfully, mm -hmm. just extraordinary team. My legislative priorities, I've got a lot. Um, gun violence uh, remains one of my top legislative priorities. Uh, you know that the gun violence epidemic, uh, it's a public health crisis, frankly, uh, has only increased during the pandemic. Uh, isolation has led to greater numbers of suicide. Uh, also, uh, you know, the number of homicides are up. The number of mass shootings are up. Uh, in a 30-day period early, the first quarter of this year, or excuse me, in the first quarter of this year, uh, there were more than 130 mass shootings, mass shooting being defined by four or more people being uh, shot, killed, or wounded. Uh, it's an epidemic. So I am on the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force. We did pass again, HR uh, 8, the char uh, close, uh, background checks, and the Charleston loophole. Uh, I want to do more. I want to do assault weapons. And of course, we need to see it through in the Senate. Uh, and we have a president that will sign these bills. Obviously, he's worked by way of executive action. That's not enough. Uh, I think you know near and dear to my heart is uh, the issue of the other public health crisis, which is the opioid crisis. Uh, my son and I re released a, a book this year, uh, a memoir about <clears throat> um, uh, his, his falling into addiction uh, and fortunately getting into long-term recovery. He's now eight years, six months in recovery from opioid addiction, uh, but the disease of addiction is claiming way too many lives. Uh, it was a, an epidemic before. Now in the, in the pandemic, in a 12 month period, not even the whole 12 months of the pandemic, there were 81,000 overdose deaths in this country. It looks like it will be 100,000 overdose deaths in this country in the 12 months of a pandemic. It is a horrifying statistic, racking families and communities. Uh, so I have legislation, uh, one which is going to be on the floor next Tuesday, Fairness and Orphan Drug Pricing Act, which will release uh, to the public in a more affordable way, um, medication, especially medication around addiction, medication assisted treatment. Uh, so that's another one of my priorities. I have a couple of bills running uh, in financial services having to do with debt relief. Uh, I have uh, I'm partnered with Andy Levin on America's College Promise Act, which looks like it will be part of uh, the president's plan moving forward, which is free community college uh, and or tuition for technical training or HBCUs. Uh, I think that will be an economic engine if we can get more young people more education or technical training without saddling them with debt. Uh, so I, I have a lot I wanna work on, a lot I, I wanna do uh, in terms of uh, making sure we lift uh, more and more children out of poverty. It's, it's powerful that we put these resources out through the American Rescue Plan, but if we say we're lifting 50% of children and therefore families out of poverty, we can't do it once and let them fall back into it. So we have to make sure we have the resources, they have the resources to be lifted out of poverty. One of those would be to increase the minimum wage, a simple thing like that, uh, so that nobody works 40 hours a week and lives in poverty. Uh, but you can imagine there's an awful lot I wanna tackle the planet, uh, protection of our planet, uh, mm -hmm. clean water, uh, and so much more. Thank you. And, and by the way, Pennsylvania is the only Northeast state that still has the 715 minimum wage laws. So what can, you know, we want to tackle it on a national basis, but we clearly need to tackle it within our state also. So you sure. talk about all these things, um, but as we watch the news, um, we are clearly in the cult of personality um, with the former president still um, holding sway over the Republican Party. And it looks like that's getting worse in the Congress um, in terms of what the uh, minority leader in the Congress is doing and how the leadership in Congress wants to change things. What's the atmosphere like? Is it, uh, do people talk to each other? 
Uh, it's not good, I have to admit to you. Uh, I, I was thinking, I've been thinking a lot about Liz Cheney. Uh, and she and I had the chance to speak when we were in that safe room on January the 6th. Uh, and we had a, a very powerful conversation. Uh, I, I was very proud that when we wound up in that space, uh, hundreds of us together, uh, both she and Hakeem Jeffries, both uh, leaders of the, our caucuses, stood uh, immediately, got to the microphone and said to the entire room, uh, whatever it takes, we will get back to the floor and continue our work. We won't be deterred. Uh, in that moment, I, sh I saw real leadership. And of course, we've seen where her real leadership is taking her. Uh, I think the Republican Party is at a, an extraordinary uh, depth uh, of, of a spiral. Uh, the, the, the atmosphere is not good. Uh, the poisonous uh, way that some of the members, newer members who are fringe, fringe, cultish uh, kinds of members uh, are controlling their conference, I think is very worrisome. And ultimately, I think will be very defeating for the Republican Party uh, moving forward. I know they're doing it to try to get the gavel and, and get the speakership in two years. Uh, I don't think this is the path to doing that. I don't think the American public will put up with it. Uh, so it, the, the conversations get rather poisonous. Uh, you, you can see it in our hearings, for example, at judiciary hearings. Uh, the Republican Party often just goes off the rails, not on the subject matter, but on, on talking points. Uh, so it's, it's not a healthy place. And as I said, with that American Rescue Plan, not getting a single Republican vote uh, I, I find that the Republican Party is grappling with itself and, and not functioning. And, and so then, you know, we're a PAC, as you know, that focuses on elections. And when we look at 2022, we're, try, we're trying to figure out how do we focus on great candidates and great policies when so much of the world is focused on um, personalities. Um, and Carolyn Adams had a very good question for you. And I've asked uh, Jamie to open up Carolyn's mic so that she can ask it directly. Um, Congresswoman, I, I really appreciate your coming to, to talk to us today. It's, it's absolutely critical that we get some direct and honest and straightforward communication about this. My question really has to do with, with your view about whether it's possible for us to get voters to look more carefully at policy than they do, and, and especially policies that serve their own interests. These days, personality has so swamped and overwhelmed our political process that I sometimes fear that people don't even care about policies that are in their own best interest. And you're all about policy, so I, I assume you've really thought about this, how, how to balance that presentation of personality compared with policy both in your own candidacy and also in the candidacies of colleagues that you see around you. Can you talk a little bit about that? I can, I grapple with it, Carolyn, and thank you for the question. Thanks for the support for represent and, and please call me Matt or Madeline. Uh, I, I can be, but I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, I grapple with it. I literally plan before a hearing uh, to try to not take the bait of the personalities uh, and, and to stay focused on the issue in front of us. Most of the time I'm successful, sometimes I'm not. Uh, but I, it, what I do believe is, this is a, a terrible example, but take a look at, I don't know if you've paid attention to, Representative Gates. <clears throat> he has been uh, a, a real difficult persona throughout the end of the Trump administration, obviously through both impeachments uh, but also take a look, he was all flash uh, and all about personality and echoing whatever the president had to say uh, and in a hyperbolic way. Uh, he, to me, that's a bit of a flash in the pan. And I think this is going to be true for these other personality cultish folks. The breakfast bar is open over here, if you can hear the coffee brewing. Um, uh, so I, I, I'm a... I'm a believer, I hope I live long enough, uh, but I'm a believer that these people who are all about the flash and the personality and having the mic for negative reasons, like a Marjorie Taylor Greene, 
only seeking negative attention and is very happy for it, I don't believe that is sustainable. And so I, I, I hope that in the end, people will recognize, uh, maybe it took uh, an insurrection, maybe it took the, just the incredible wave of disinformation for people to be a little more skeptical and to say, I need to look further. Uh, Represent has always been about this, but how important these state legislatures are. We've seen it in terms of the issues of voting rights, women's rights. Uh, I hope, I hoped two years ago, frankly, that we would have been more successful in getting others into the state legislature, focused on issues, not focused on this cultish personality. So Carolyn, my answer is imperfect. I'm an optimist who believes a lot of these folks will flame out, uh, but I could be very wrong. Thanks. Thank you. You know, that's something, as you know, we struggle with, and that's why we do these briefings. That's why we're trying to um, be out on social media and work with other groups on issues. Because uh, I was at a discussion with somebody from the media recently about um, rural Pennsylvania. He said, we have to understand rural Pennsylvania, abortion, immigration. I said, I'm not talking abortion, immigration. I'm talking quality of water. I'm talking about education funding. How do we get to people and tell them what a disservice? And, I, and you know, it's a national issue. It's a Pennsylvania issue. How do, we, how do we communicate better? We talked about, you talk about the importance of so much of the legislation you've passed in the House. Some things like the um, American Rescue Plan got through on reconciliation in the Senate. Other things are going to take uh, either getting rid of the filibuster or a miracle to get through the Senate. Um, but hoping that some things get through. Are you all, and is everybody, is your conference geared up to for 2022? Is your conference geared up to talk about what a difference it's made to have a Democrat in the, in the White House, but to get this legislation done so people can turn around and say, well, I may like this guy for uh, you know, my culture war issues, but on the other hand, that check in my pocket was pretty nice. You know, how do we help people to understand in 2022 that because of the Democrats and the Democratic actions, their lives are better? Well, uh, that's a really good point. And what I have been talking about, any to anybody who will listen to me, is uh, take a look at what Congress did do uh, during a pandemic. We stood up quickly and recognized uh, we were facing something we had never faced before uh, and put together packages uh, of real relief. Uh, that broke down uh, with the new election, uh, with a new president, and then it, it was on us, it was on Democrats. And you're, you're right, through reconciliation, we were, were able to pass the American Rescue Plan. Uh, what I wanna keep boasting about is how bold that was, how amazing it is that we did put checks in people's pockets. We continued and increased PPP because that was important. We have in there $120 billion, federal dollars for schools, state and local government money. How could anybody think those resources aren't valuable and important? Uh, as I said, lifting children out of poverty, being able to talk about the poor through our policies uh, and take credit for it. The Democrats should take credit for it uh, and say, how did we lift out of this uh, economic collapse and, and COVID virus uh, through bold investment in American families? We have to take the credit for that. We did learn the lesson in the Obama administration where uh, people didn't realize uh, the impact that they were getting from the federal government. It was diluted. We didn't, we didn't point it out directly to families. In this pandemic, I think families are recognizing uh, that their, their, their economy is better as a result of democratic policies that put resources directly to them. We have to keep boasting of that. We have to get the infrastructure job investment uh, out to American people. That will, I hope, determine the next election cycle. For all the rhetoric and all the shiny objects over on, on the right, if they see these differences in their communities, in their own economic circumstances, but in their communities, in their schools, in their state and local governments, uh, I, I think they'll be persuaded. Please feel free to brag. 
You know, I think uh, they say that Obama never wanted to take a victory lap. This is the time for lots of victory laps, lots of bragging, lots of things talking about this would not be done without you. We struggle with people still, and as you remember from your days in the state legislature, we still struggle with helping people to understand what the state legislature does versus what Congress does. And there are so many issues, you know, you talk about the funding that's gonna be provided. My big fear is that that funding goes to Harrisburg and, and who knows how it gets allocated and what happens. What advice do you have about telling people how important and, and getting the word out about how important the state legislature is and how much of their lives are controlled in Harrisburg? Well, that's something I have struggled with uh, from the time I was in the state legislature to today. Uh, but it is about conversations like this. Uh, you know, at the state level, I cared about some of these very same issues. And I kept saying, okay, if the national level won't do something about gun violence, let's do it here in Pennsylvania. And of course we were stopped at every turn. Uh, that's a problem because the state would have the chance to make a difference on the opioid addiction crisis. The state does have a chance uh, to do things about voting rights and the planet. And obviously the state also has the chance to harm our voting rights, to harm our planet. Uh, and so what I always said to people was, you want your state leaders to be doing the right things for policies for Pennsylvania, but you also want that mirrored uh, uh, by the federal government. Uh, and when the federal government fails, the Pennsylvania state legislature is the one to turn to. Uh, unfortunately, the majority has not shared my policy priorities in terms of expanding voting rights, in terms of expanding protection of our planet, in, in terms of uh, making sure that women's rights are protected. Uh, the legislature is critically important. You saw it through impeachment. Look what happened in terms of the challenges to the election uh, right here in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania was critical among the state's electors challenge. Uh, and of course, the courts did the right thing. The attorney general did the right thing. But the state legislature was in cahoots with the big lie. Uh, the majority that is not 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 everybody but the majority sadly uh, so that that's a perfect sad test case of the power of a state legislature uh, and when they lack leadership in the right direction how dangerously close uh, you can come to undoing democracy undoing people's votes taking away people's precious vote it, it's amazing. And, um, and getting that message out is all of our responsibilities. You know, we can't count on just our electeds to do this. We all have to be putting pressure on the press and on our peers and everybody we know to make change here. You know, given your focus on the opioid crisis, how do you feel about marijuana? Well, I, I have to tell you, I was in the state legislature uh, when uh, medical marijuana came up. Uh, and I remember uh, thinking, uh, while I was in favor of medical marijuana and going to vote yes for it, I thought this is Pennsylvania, we will never get this across. Uh, but you know what happened? It was the power of persuasion. Advocates, you remember this, Christine, they literally, families camped out in the rotunda in Harrisburg for weeks upon weeks upon weeks. It is the power of persuasion uh, and public sentiment. And so, uh, as Lincoln said, you know, with public sentiment, almost anything is possible. Without it, almost nothing. Uh, so my my re reaction to well, this is Harrisburg. We'll never get this done. Was wrong because of public sentiment, and we passed medical marijuana. Uh, I am in favor of, and my son and I have been doing a lot of zooms about this book, and he he has some chilling effects on me. But I am in favor of legalizing marijuana, taxing it. Uh, regulating it, uh, and and yet my son has uh, some hesitancy about that. So we're not exactly on the same page, but I think that's that's a healthy way to be. Uh, I want to be smart about it. I want to make sure that we research and know what we're doing, and regulate and know what we're doing, and also tax it. Uh, that's where I am on on marijuana. No, I think that's. Um... Guess what? She has a very logical thought through answer. She's thinking about the implications on a variety of different levels, uh, just what we expect from you. So uh, thank you for your response. I also highly recommend her book, the book she wrote with her son, because it deals with, you know, it's almost like dealing with parallel issues. 
what's going on in her life, what's going on in her son's life, and, and how they intersect and how she came to, to realize the deep trouble that her son was in and how he came out of it. And it's, it's a, a very moving book. I, as a, a working mother, can relate to all of the, uh, how did I miss this kind of comments? Because it's really, you know, there are things you just don't always see. And it's, and it's a very touching, um, wonderful book to read. So I highly recommend it to people. Thanks, Christine. And you know, our, our ambition is to help somebody. Uh, that maybe somebody will see themselves either in me, uh, a mother stumbling to figure out what's going on, but much more importantly, maybe somebody will see themselves in Harry uh, and see that there is hope in recovery. Yeah, thank you. Um, do you have any closing words for us? I, you know, I promised your staff that you'd stay with us just a half an hour. We're happy to have you longer, but I just wondered if you wanted to uh, say a few other words that aren't prompted by me. Well, Christine, uh, just a sincere thank you. There's one area we haven't talked about, which I think uh, I, I know you all are talking about, which is just a, a, a social justice reckoning. Uh, one of the big things that we passed, and it was part of uh, the work of the Judiciary Committee last Congress, and of course, again, this Congress, uh, is the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Uh, the beginning, the recognition of systemic racism, where it lies in different institutions across our country. Uh, and so uh, I, I hope we can have healthier, open conversations, recognizing uh, our stumbles as a country with 400 years legacy uh, of slavery. Um, I hope we can move forward. I, I was so moved by, inspired by Black Lives Matter protests uh, for a, a simple reason. I'm sure you, many of you participated, but it was a lot of white people like me who had to really listen and to learn that our experience is not the same across this country, that diversity is something we celebrate, and yet we sometimes try to put blinders on in terms of diversity, in, in terms of treatment, whether it's criminal justice treatment and the rest. So I do hope that somewhere in this Congress, we will be able to move forward, the Senate move forward on the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act because it's a part of a greater conversation. Sure, it would be helpful for policing practices, uh, but more importantly, for the greater conversation uh, around um, racism in our country. How can we get to a better place in recognizing what is uh, and changing within ourselves, uh, our own thoughts and our own behaviors? So, it's, that's one of the big issues that I really hope we will someday be able to have more and more honest conversations around. You know, one of the um, real um, basic tenets of Represent is that we believe in reflective democracy. We believe that until and unless our elected officials look like all of us, and that's gender, which is a key point of Represent, obviously, but it's also race, it's, it's uh, sexual orientation, it's economic background, it's, ec it's education, it's a variety of experiences. But until our elected officials look like all of us in all of those respects, we won't have the democracy we think we have. And I think what, what your point is, is that we've deluded ourselves for a long time. Hey, we all have equal opportunity. This is America, you know. And uh, we've all learned, I think it's been one of the um, interesting things during the pandemic is I think people have had a lot more time to think about these issues. And I hope that they have. Um, one of the interesting things for us in Pennsylvania right now is as we go ahead and do redistricting of the uh, House, Pennsylvania State House and State Senate, for the first time, there are two women on the panel, the, the majority leader of the um, Senate and the minority uh, chair of the House are both women. And Joanna McClinton is a woman of color. She's a black woman representing Philadelphia and, right. and West Philly. And I think that that just is gonna add a whole different piece to this discussion about reflective democracy. Because in the past, I think the last time um, redistricting was done, oh, guess what happened in Pennsylvania House? There were a few white women whose districts were kind of combined together so that you could uh, reduce the amount of diversity, gender diversity in the House. And I don't think that'll happen because we have different people looking at these things. That's a reason for optimism. You're absolutely right. I served with Joanna. She's, she's fabulous. 
she's a, an amazing person. And we're also happy that uh, we have four members of Congress right now who are women. And we thank you for being one of the, uh, I think up until the 2018 election, Pennsylvania had only ever, ever, ever had eight women in Congress. And now we've had 12 altogether. So we're, we're making great progress. We've still never had a woman senator. We've still never had a woman governor. Um, so uh, 2022, both seats are open and we're hoping that somewhere, somehow we'll make a difference and change the uh, diversity of the Pennsylvania um, representation in um, DC. But here, here. agree. Yeah. Agree. Yeah, Absolutely. that's my commercial. So thank you very much for joining us. We're all in this. We're all proud of you. We're all proud that you represent Pennsylvania and really thrilled that you're able to take, to take the time to be with us today. Well, thank you. And oh, I, I see have one other comment for you. Somebody asked a question that they're having trouble with something related to their PPP loan um, for uh, beyond for a uh, nonprofit. And um, can I put them in touch with the, Megan, I think was the one who helped me schedule this, but can I put them in touch with her to see if it could get into your office a little bit? Absolutely. We love helping people along those lines. So yes, constituent services is what we like doing. And I love connecting people to the resources that I've told you I'm so proud to have been a part of passing. So you bet, please send them to me. Uh, hello, Mary Herdick, hello, Lynn Marks and all my other friends. Uh, and I'm gonna say goodbye. Thank you for inviting me, Christine. Let's do it again. Thank you. That was thrilling for all of us, I think. Just um, it gave us just a different perspective on, you know, our work and what we're doing and the value of it. And I love that she knows how valuable we are. So I was talking about redistricting. I was talking about we now have somebody. So uh, next time we'll talk about what the calendar is. We're all waiting to see what all the census data looks like. Um, but as I mentioned, I'm thrilled that there's at least, you know, it's not for, excuse me for saying this, we do love some white men, um, but it's not for white men making the decision. There is a little diversity in the um, panel. And again, it's, it's, it's not that um, the decisions are necessarily going to be different. It's good to have different people's experiences be part of the process. I want to remind people, um, the Pennsylvania primaries, May 18th, there's a lot of the ju judicial races are important. Uh, go and look at the ballot questions where our state legislature wants to, I think the first two are around uh, taking away power from the governor, really. Um, and uh, there's some very important races. I'm happy I've already voted and I got a note back that uh, they've received my ballot, so it makes me feel good. But we all need to be voting in this election. Finally, again, be part of the movement. I'd love for you to somebody just send us emails and let us know um, what other topics you'd like to see. We try and do um, a news jacking, you know, where we see something going on and try and get somebody to be part of our discussion. Um, the next one that I'm sure of will be on next briefing we're going to have, I'm sure of, is June 3rd. Um, you may know that we have a new, you know, Leanne Kruger from Delaware County is actually the first representative in the legislature who we actually supported and she won. So we have special feel, you know, early in our cycle, we we had a few that we didn't win. So, um, and Leanne is the uh, legislative lead for the House uh, Democratic Campaign Committee for Pennsylvania. And there's a new executive director, Trevor Sutherland, and we're very enthusiastic about him. He comes out of Virginia. And if you've paid attention to the news, you know that Virginia in 2019, um, their legislature flipped from uh, Republican to Democrat. And the extra added value in my mind is that then they ended up with a, with a Democratic woman speaker and a Democratic woman majority leader in um, their legislature. And so he is moving on from Virginia to Pennsylvania, and we're going to have him um, on June 3rd. So, um, but any other topics that you want, things you find of interest, subjects that you think we should be uh, delving into more, please just email us. We'd love to have you be more involved. And by the way, we, we accept money. Um, we've already raised enough money this cycle to, um, uh, to fund all of our expenses for this whole cycle. You know, we're, we're a very inexpensive pack, but we do have... Um, some operations we support, our online support, our, our legal support, um, but all of that is already paid for with some donations we've received in 2021. So every dime we receive 
from now through 2022 is all going to go to candidates that we all support and that we like. And what, one of the things we've heard from candidates and we keep hearing is the value of early money. So we want to be giving money. We've got some candidates who were snuck in there. Uh, women like if you watched our water presentation or you can go look at it on our YouTube channel, um, you see Senator Katie Muth is a very big target for our Republicans from all over the country. And, um, and we wanna be able to give her early money in her campaign for 2022. And there are others who we know are gonna be targets. We wanna be able to give them money in 2021 so they can ramp up, so they can do some deep canvassing, so they can know what's going on in their district sooner. And so we're trying to raise more money in 2021. So with that, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Nancy Ginter, I will send you the contact name for the person who helped me schedule um, uh, Madeline so that you can go to her and, and figure out how to get some support for um, Beyond Celiac. So. Thank you very much to every. Oh, Mariah Fisher, you're on the call. Can we open up her uh, microphone? I just noticed that you're on with us. Hi. Meg, thanks for the note. Mariah Fisher is running in a special election. It's a, a tough race. It's a hard race, but she's running um, in, in, it's at the time of the primary, but it is a special election. Mariah, tell us how fabulous you are and um, what your path to victory is. Well, uh, thank you. I, I very much appreciate uh, Represent PA reaching out to me and for the support. Um, we're, it, it's a tough race, the, there's no doubt about it. Um, I'm in a very red district. We're a very rural area. However, um, I'm currently a borough councilwoman in my community. Um, I've done a lot of work and outreach with my residents that live here, and I have a lot of support both from Republicans and Democrats at this point. Republicans that I've worked with understand that I'm passionate and dedicated and willing to put in the time and effort. Um, as you said uh, earlier, and as, as Congresswoman Dean said, I'm, I'm the candidate that doesn't really want the spotlight. I want to put in the work, I want to put in the time, and I want to do things that are helpful for the people that live in this district. I don't really love the spotlight and talking about myself in that part, but I'm very passionate that I think that we have a great area that we live in, um, and there's a lot of opportunity here, but we need someone that's willing to, to work for us. Um, and so, you know, we, we've been, you know, talking to lots of voters. We've had a lot of positive feedback. For anyone um, that is interested, uh, this race is also interesting because my opponent is Leslie Rossi. Um, she is the owner of the Trump House that some of you may be familiar with that is in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. Um, so she's another uh, candidate that, that I don't think that she's doing this for the right reasons. I don't believe that she is doing this to actually help anyone, but more to just for her own benefit and, and to say that she is a representative. Um, so that has also uh, led to a lot of people being interested in my race um, and supporting me, both Republicans and Democrats again. Because it's a special election, one of the things that we keep talking to people about is that everyone can vote for me, Republicans, Democrats, independents. Um, because independents who wouldn't necessarily go out on primary day, they can go out and vote and they will make a difference. That will help. Um, so we've just been doing a lot of um, outreach and talking to people. We're finally knocking on doors, but we're doing it safely with masks, um, you know, kind of keeping distance from everybody. Um, so it is a tough seat to flip. And I and and based on the numbers, it does not look great. But I do think that we have a lot of momentum and that there are people that are excited to vote for me and to have a choice in this race. Um, I don't believe this seat has ever actually been held by a Democrat. So winning it would be a a big deal. <laughs> um, so I'm excited and I'm working as hard as I can. And again, I really appreciate uh, Represent PA, your support um, and reaching out to me and, and being interested in this race, because I do think that we need to flip whatever we can um, to actually get work and to actually get help for our, for, our, for all of Pennsylvania, um, but particularly in this district. So um, thank you again. And I don't know if anyone has any questions, but um, I'm, I'm, we're in the final home stretch here and I'm working real hard to try to you know, make this happen. Well, thank you for running. We appreciate your uh, running. Um, we were happy to find that, um, that there was a strong woman running in one of these races. We know it's a difficult district. Uh, talk about water quality, talk about, um, and talk about education funding. These are big issues that people don't realize how much of it is controlled by Harrisburg and how nothing is being done by the Republicans. And the Trump House lady probably will not help. So. Thank you very much for running. And again, thank you everybody for coming in today. 
and uh, we loved seeing you. Have a good day.